and that we must now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice. And I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Kesh Deverhain, let us hold question number one, please. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have had general discussions around the police budget with the Chief Constable and with members of the Policing Board. The allocation of the police budget, however, is an operational matter and therefore the responsibility of the Chief Constable accountable to the Board and not for me as Minister. Mr Boylan for supplementary. Um, could I thank the Minister for his reply and thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. But could I ask the Minister, would he give some consideration when future planning um, into whether or not the, uh, the cost of police overtime will uh, increase or decrease over the next number of years? Has he considered that in, in terms of future plan or will he factor that in, in any consideration? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, it's clear that current changes are going to make difficulties for the police in terms of managing the budget uh, in line with the overall responsibilities they have. But I repeat again the point, I cannot go into the detail as to exactly how operationally the Chief Constable chooses to divide his budget. Clearly, if there are fewer officers at times, he may feel compelled to increase overtime. On the other hand, with a general reduction in budget, it's very difficult to see how that overtime can be increased significantly. But to repeat the point I made early on, it is not for me to tell him how to allocate that budget. And Mr. Danny Kinahan is not in his place. I call Mr. David Michael uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister will be aware um, that in light of the budgetary pressures, uh, his department has undergone a 4.4% um, decrease in its budget um, in this incoming year. However, the PSNI have had to undertake over 7%. Uh, I wonder, could the Minister um, confirm, as the Chief Constable has hinted, um, that he's putting barristers before bobbies? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, that's certainly not a hint that I would recognise from anything said by the Chief Constable. The Chief Constable has to live within the budget which is allocated to the PSNI, just the same as every other spending area of the Department of Justice has to live within its spending limit. The reality is there were significant pressures within the Department of Justice, not least because we had not driven through the programme of legal aid as fast as would have been hoped, with some matters that have been resting before the Justice Committee for some months. All of that has contributed to building up on the current pressure, which, faced with the decision of the finance minister and the executive to change the basis on which the DOJ budget was ring-fenced in year without warning, has given significant difficulties to the Department of Justice. Having had greater cuts over this CSR spending period than the block as a whole, quite significantly greater because of the linkages to the Home Office and the MOGA. Further, more severe cuts have now been imposed on the Department of Justice. And given the existing legal pressures under which legal aid is obliged to be paid, it was simply not possible to protect all the spending areas that we would have wished to do. And I call Ms. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, notwithstanding, it is an operational matter, uh, police overtime for the PSNI Chief Constable. Uh, would the uh, Minister agree with me that much of the overtime is because of a failure to have leadership around public order events, and particularly parades and protests? And would the Minister therefore look to uh, uh, give political cover to the, uh, the Chief Constable in uh, charging for such events if there's any gaps in the legislation that need to be filled? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I can certainly agree with the first point that Mrs Kelly made, that a very significant amount of overtime is related to public order issues. As I have said in this chamber on more than one occasion, and I fear I may have to say on more occasions, as to the precise issue of charging for events which happen in open public space, I think there are very significant issues there which go beyond the kind of instant uh, response which we might wish. Um, I have no doubt that there are some members of this House who would wish to see some particular uh, bodies charged because of events which they hold in the open air, and perhaps other people would have preferences for other people being charged. That's a measure of the difficulty we're in. What we do need to see is a resolution to the kind of problems which have led to public order difficulties on the streets over the last couple of years. We need to see the political leadership, which has just been talked of by the First Minister, actually coming to play within a talks process so that we can cut back on those public order disputes and, incidentally, cut back on the police expenses for policing them. Call Ms. Michaela Boyle. 
Councillor Margaret, uh, can the Minister commit himself to uh, provide extra resources to the Ombudsman's Office uh, in light of the additional funding he has received lately? Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I do think it's a slight jump from the funding for the police to the funding for the, I take it, uh, Ms. Boyle meant Police Ombudsman's Office. The reality is the Police Ombudsman's Office is being protected very significantly compared to other aspects of the Department of Justice spending. They have, they are the only spending area within the Justice family which has had an increase in expenditure over the last three years, and they are suffering cuts no more than the average, the 4.4%, which has just been spoken of uh, in this particular uh, year as part of the monitoring round. That seems to me to be very significant protection for the police ombudsman. And the call, Mr. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the concern which there is for, from the SDLP and Sinn Féin about the pressures on the police overtime budget, would the Minister not agree with me that one simple way of reducing those pressures would be for those two parties to stop manufacturing contentious parades which require additional policing and therefore increase the police overtime bill? Principal Deputy Speaker, it would be so much nicer if the, if the member was asking me to agree with him if he didn't stand wagging his finger at me in a manner which is coming close to unparliamentary. Um, I'm, I, I thought I made some general points about contentious parades and public order matters. They were not in any sense aimed at one particular group which organises such parades or another. The reality is we have problems of parades and protests in different areas from, with people from different backgrounds, although I wasn't actually aware that the SDLP organised many, perhaps somebody can tell me in the next question, but there, but there, are, there are clearly issues which are of significant concern in terms of the imposition on public order and the concomitant difficulties around community relations which come from a number of parades and the related protests. That's what I said earlier. I hope to see ended by resolution in the talks process. Okay, we'll move on and here at least. I call Fergan McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number three. To date, the Prison Review Oversight Group, which I chair, <coughs> has deemed 60, 16 of the 40 PRT recommendations complete. The group has also referred a further 17 recommendations to Sijini and RQIA as appropriate for independent assessment. This means that 33 of the 40 recommendations are either complete or under assessment. I anticipate that the seven remaining recommendations will be brought to the Oversight Group in December 2014 or March 2015. This reform program has been about modernizing the Northern Ireland Prison Service to ensure resources are best directed at reducing reoffending and making the community safer. As part of that, we've also developed a more efficient and effective service. The foundations have been laid for lasting change. However, the economic challenges that we now face were not envisaged by the prison review team when they made their recommendations. The review team anticipated that savings made through reform initiatives, such as the Voluntary Early Retirement Scheme, could be reinvested back into prisons. But this has not been possible. Nor has it been possible to invest as much in the voluntary and community sector as the review team and I had hoped. Whilst my ambitions haven't diminished, the reality is that difficult decisions will need to be made around how NIPS delivers for everyone in Northern Ireland. Despite the cuts, the reforms being overseen by the Prison Review Oversight Group are significant and they're lasting. While the budget reduction is challenging, I believe that we can continue to deliver a modern, focused prison service with partnership working to reduce offending at its core. Call Mr. McKinney for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank uh, the Minister? Um, and I hear from him that the budgetary cuts are severely impacting, uh, if I'm not putting words in his mouth, but what impact will there be on the provision of health care, including mental health care, within the prison service? Well, Mr. McKinney referred to the general issue of cost. Let me just give a couple of figures. At the time of devolution in 2010 11, the cost per prisoner place was almost £74,000 per year, and it's been reduced in the last financial year to under £63,000. So that is a 21% reduction anticipated by this year, a very significant improvement in efficiency. The specific point, however, which he highlights around health care, specifically mental health care, which I acknowledge is a very significant issue for the prisons, is actually, as it's now the responsibility of the South Eastern Trust, an issue for DHSSPS to address and not for the DOJ. Clearly, we work in partnership, but the precise issue of how services are provided is not something I can answer. 
I call Raymond McCartney for a supplement. Gordon Milgert, the Prevlast Crown Cooler, August Gorn Vegas, Lesson Era, Dawn Fragerson. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank uh, the Minister for his question? In, in relation to, uh, you give some indication about the rollout of the implementation plan. Can the Minister provide some update as to its impact on McGabry Prison? Well, I be, believe, Principal Deputy Speaker, there's been a significant impact across all three prisons, not just around McGabry. For example, at McGavery, we have seen, uh, with the opening of Coyle House, significant work being done with those who wish to reduce uh, drug dependency, with work being done on the Family Matters landing. I also visited in Glen House a specific intensive project uh, for 12 prisoners seeking to come off drug habits, all of which is related to ensuring that people are less likely to reoffend when they come out. There's also been ongoing engagement through particularly business in the community with potential employers to ensure that we provide the opportunities for people to get employment when they leave and therefore are less likely to reoffend. All of those are very significant issues, working with partners in the volunteering community sector and working with staff being used in a more effective way to promote the rehabilitation of prisoners. I think we've seen significant improvements from that work at McGabry and in the other two institutions. I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister, why is there no progress in reducing the misuse of drugs in prison? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I've, I've just given examples of work which is being done to reduce drug dependency in prison. There is clearly a significant drug problem in prisons, just as there is in the whole of this society. Sadly, it is not something which can be avoided in prisons when it is so prevalent elsewhere. But in terms of work which is being done, there's work being done around education, there's work being done around prevention, there is work being done to assist those who indicate a willingness to come off drugs in different ways. And there is no doubt that, for example, uh, on some of the preventive work, a much more focused uh, program of searching, rather than random searching, intelligence-led searching, has led to a reduction in the number of searches, but an increase in the number of drugs found. That's an indication of good work which is actually being done within the prison service. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Number four. Principal Deputy Speaker, the decision to close the custody facilities at Limavady Police Station is an operational matter for the Chief Constable. I understand the Chief Constable has already outlined his reasons for the closure to the member and indicated that he is confident that this will not impact on crime levels or outcome rates in the area. I thank the, the Minister for the response, but uh, is the Minister aware that shortly after the Limavati custody suite was closed, my information is that the Coleraine custody suite was also closed temporarily. Has he an indication from the Chief Constable as to when the Coleraine custody suite will reopen, as given the current uh, position is that many people being detained have to travel 50, 60 or more miles for custody? Well, I have no specific information on the Coleraine question, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, but given that with, you know, within the Limavady uh, area in G District within the policing, there are currently operational uh, custody suites in Waterside, in Strand Road and in Straban. I'm not quite sure how anybody from that direction will be travelling 50 or 60 miles. If it is an issue for Coleraine, then certainly the distance from Coleraine to Antrim, where there are very significant custody suite, is somewhat less than 50 miles. And I call Ms. Sandra Overham. No, she did not. And we will move on. And I call Mr. Edwin Putz. <clears throat> Where individuals commit serious crimes, the shared focus of our justice system is to bring them to account for their actions. Where there are allegations of historical institutional abuse, it is the responsibility of the police to gather and present evidence and of the public prosecution service to assess the strength of the case prepared by the police and to determine whether it should proceed to court. As Minister of Justice, I quite rightly have no direct role in this process. Consequently, whilst I can confirm that the PSNI is devoting considerable resources to investigating historical institutional abuse, it is a matter for police officers to present the outcome of their investigations and for the independent prosecution service to determine whether this constitutes sufficient evidence to bring such cases to court. I call Mr. Pitts for a supplementary. 
Could I thank the Minister for his answer and I welcome the fact that he has included the PPS because last week when uh, responding on the Maria Cahill issue he referred solely to the police ombudsman who of course has no responsibilities for the PPS or indeed for Northern Ireland office interference. Can I have an assurance um, from the Minister however uh, that in investigations into historic abuse that it doesn't matter whether it's a police officer in Concora, whether it's a priest in Ruban or whether it's a provo in West Belfast, that there is going to be no untouchables when it comes to paedophile abuse? Well, of course, Principal Deputy Speaker, as Minister, I cannot guarantee, I think that's the term the member used, that that is the case, but it certainly is my belief that there are no untouchables in the way the PSNI uh, conducts its responsibilities and the way the PPS conducts its responsibilities in the present day. There are clearly difficulties when we go back a number of years in terms of dealing with those points. That is what is currently coming out from the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry. And uh, I've seen no evidence to suggest that any matters which arise will not be properly considered by the agencies responsible for investigation and prosecution carrying out their duties fairly and impartially. Thank you very much. Uh, the Minister will be aware that much uh, historical abuse did not take place within institutions, leaving people like Maria Cahill feeling abandoned. What are the Minister's proposals for ensuring that such victims uh, are not left feeling as second-class citizens compared to the victims of institutional abuse? Well, uh, the Member has highlighted one particular issue concerning one particular young lady and that is obviously a matter which causes considerable concern to many of us in the way that was reported in the media. Uh, running into the issue of an inquiry um, is more difficult in the context where we're merely at this stage talking about one case. If there are, if there are others, as has been hinted by Ms. Cattle, who she is aware of, who have been similarly abused, then I would urge them to come forward, however long it may be since their abuse, and make their concerns known to the police so that the police can do their work and prepare a file and pass it to the Public Prosecution Service. That is what we would hope anybody would do, and in current circumstances, I believe there is no reason why anybody should not be prepared to put their trust in the work to be done by the PSNI and the PPS. If there are wider issues which emerge from that, then it may well be that there are appropriate issues to be considered by a public inquiry. But the important issue at this stage is that any of us who have any influence should encourage anybody who is in that position to come forward, however difficult the issues may be, however long ago it may be, they should come forward and report their concerns and ensure that the police have them investigated. Can I ask the Minister, uh, can the Minister reaffirm that all investigations and prosecution uh, processes should be free from uh, political interference? I detected an irony warning immediately to my right, Principal Deputy Speaker. I can certainly confirm that all investigations into any uh, criminal allegation should be free from political interference. What, of course, I cannot do is guarantee that other politicians don't attempt to interfere. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I thank the Minister for his uh, previous answers. And the most interesting answer is, of course, in relation to uh, if there are other people affected in a similar way to Maria Cal, that uh, the, the minister uh, could see a public inquiry. Uh, is the minister saying that uh, he would uh, himself try to set up that public inquiry and is he committed to that if other victims emerge? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I don't think I'm in a position to commit to such an inquiry. It seems to me that such a thing would have ramifications rather beyond my department. Uh, but certainly, I think I, I could only repeat the first point I made. The important issue is that individuals come forward and make the police aware of what happened to them. Uh, that may then give us an assessment as to issues which may need to be addressed. And frankly, this may go back to the point I made at the early part of question time about the wider issues concerned with reconciling the past and seeing how different institutions behaved at different times in the past as we seek to build a different and shared future. And we come to Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. It's question number six, Minister. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, youth engagement clinics have been operating successfully in Belfast from October of 2012, and I'm pleased to say that the plans to roll out youth engagement clinics to all police districts are now well advanced. Training is currently being delivered to police officers in H District, with a view to clinics being available in areas such as Ballycastle, Ballymena, Ballymoney, Coleraine and Larne by the end of November. Training will then be completed in the remaining police districts with a view to clinics being operational right across Northern Ireland in the first quarter of 2015. Based on experience to date, I'm confident that the clinics will help reduce the number of cases involving young people that proceed unnecessarily to court and thereby improve processing times for youth court cases. Mr. Lund for supplement. Yes, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister outline how the youth engagement clinics that ran during the pilot programme affected performance in, in youth cases? Well, the, the, the key answer to that, Principal Deputy Speaker, is that the pilot established significant successes for youth engagement clinics in terms of resolving issues more quickly than would have been dealt with by, at court or even if they were disposed of police by, by a different kind of diversion outside the youth engagement clinic. Um, the analysis of the data gathered from Belfast in the pilot found the average processing time was 39 days as opposed to 53 days for non-clinic diversion cases. The performance in youth cases in Belfast improved significantly. In the first quarter of this year, the time taken to prepare and submit a charge file was 11 days rather than 22 days in the same period in the previous year, which is very significant showing the good work is being done and the improvements which are continuing within Belfast. I think it's absolutely clear that by maintaining this pathway to deal with that low level offending, we're able to see improvements in services for them and also the concentration of resources on those where there are more significant issues and they've certainly been able to ensure that young people access the supports they need to keep them off a re-offending path at an earlier stage to the benefit of them and to the community. Well, can I ask the Minister, uh, is the Minister satisfied that the PCSP should be really to the fore of ensuring maximum public engagement between the PSNI and the public? Principal Deputy Speaker, I really can't see what PCSPs have got to do with youth engagement clinics. Uh, my views on the need to maximise the efforts of PCSPs are well known to the House. And I call Mr Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister has in indicated that these youth engagement clinics will be rolled out across my constituency. Does he suggest with those who maybe seem to implement that these clinics are, can be an easy and a soft option for young offenders? I think, Principal Deputy Speaker, all the evidence is to the contrary. Many young people have said that they are being forced at an early stage to confront the consequences of their reoffending. Um, in many cases, to have a direct meeting with those who, whose their crimes were against. It actually is a more difficult task than waiting a few months and being given a fine or whatever. I think that's the whole point about the restorative approach which is taken within the youth justice system. It actually ensures that young people face up to the consequences of their behaviour and are then less likely to re-offend than if they were simply treated in a conventional way with a fine or whatever. Good. And I call Ms. Bronwyn McGowan. Gourmet, I'll get to question six. Sorry, question seven. <laughs> I was going to answer question seven anyway, Principal Deputy Speaker. The PSNI Rural Crime Unit is a central resource for identifying trends and patterns of rural crime. This information is used by police commanders to enhance the effectiveness of their operational tactics in preventing and detecting rural and agricultural crime. The unit is supported by a data analyst part funded by, by my department. At a regional level, the work of the unit resulted in an initiative whereby over £3 million worth of agricultural equipment has now been fitted with security devices. At a strategic level, the work of the unit is supported by the Rural Crime Partnership. This partnership, led by my department, comprises representatives of the PSNI, NFU Mutual and the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. The partnership recently met with a range of stakeholders, including the Ulster Farmers Union and the National Sheep Association, to seek their views on livestock theft. Discussions are ongoing to develop actions to help address this issue. The impact of the unit is reinforced at a local level by interventions delivered by PCSPs in conjunction with the PSNI. In South Tyrone, these have included FarmWatch, text alert schemes for farmers, trailer marking, and the provision of multi-purpose security locks. 
I, I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, given that the remit of the Rural Crime Unit is to help the PSA utilise its resources in the most effective way, can the Minister elaborate how the Rural Crime Unit can be used on a cross-border basis, given that AHAR, which happens to be the, the hotspot for, for rural crime, um, is on a border with, with County Monaghan? I'm always surprised, Principal Deputy Speaker, when any MLA highlights their own constituency as being a hotspot for crime. But it is the sad reality that if we look at livestock thefts, the two counties out of 32 which had the worst statistics last year on the island were Armagh and Tyrone. So the member correctly highlights the problem we have to address. There are issues there which clearly need to be addressed uh, regarding uh, traceability of cattle in particular. Sheep are more difficult. And there are issues where, on a cross-border basis, the work of the Rural Crime Unit in terms of analysing the data is of assistance to the PSNI as they work in cooperation with Angada Shikona to deal with the issues where there are clearly some cross-border movements of stolen livestock. But it is an issue which requires ongoing vigilance, and we have yet to see the full statistical results of the first year of operation of the Rural Crime Unit, which is only just complete. I call Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for, for the answers. The Minister will be aware that less than two weeks ago the, the Chief Constable indicated that community policing in rural areas would become virtually non-existent. How worried is the Minister about that, particularly in places like Fermanagh and South Tyrone and indeed Armagh, and has he had any discussion to the Chief Constable about uh, that situation? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I frequently discuss these sorts of general issues with the Chief Constable. Um, I think uh, when he talks about the kind of policing which is likely to become non-existent, he was specifically talking about neighbourhood policing as opposed to response policing. And I think we need to be careful we don't raise unnecessary hairs. But there is no doubt that at a time of increasing difficulty, there will be problems for the PSNI in continuing to maintain services, and they are having to prioritise. That's why it's quite clear that certain difficult areas will be a priority for neighbourhood policing and other areas will simply uh, go back to the situation not that long ago when there was less of a neighbourhood input and more of a response policing input. But the challenge is for the Chief Constable to determine exactly how he allocates resources. I can only report in general on what he has said. Thank you. And I call Mr Kieran McCarthy. Gurnham, I got last call call you. Quest Ahocht, could I uh, have question eight to the Minister of Justice, please? I am pleased to say that my department has made significant progress in the challenging process of transforming the Young Offenders Centre into a secure college. NIPS has worked to put in place the structures, processes and cultural change necessary to deliver a college that will not only meet the needs of those in custody, but will also give them the skills they need to build positive lives when they are resettled back into the community. Helping young offenders to change their lives will in turn help to make Northern Ireland safer. Design principles have been developed which capture the vision ethos and direction for the college, which we will implement in full in transition from April 2015. There have been a number of significant developments that will provide the infrastructure for the college. These include a draft timetable across all residential areas. Progress has also been made on a curriculum for the college that will meet the specific needs of the prisoners and address educational underachievement by many of those in custody. The college will also build transferable vocational skills in areas such as horticulture, catering, construction trades and industrial cleaning that will help to make the young men more employable when they're released back into the community. I recently chaired a meeting of the oversight group at High Bank Wood and discussed the college development with the senior team in the prison service. McCarthy for a supplement. Colonel Mahi got last time call you. And I thank the Minister for his uh, very detailed response. Would the Minister agree with me that, or could he tell me, tell the, the, the Assembly, if um, what has been, the good work has been done on Hyde Bank could be replicated throughout all of the Northern Irish prisons? Well, of course, the specific issue, Principal Deputy Speaker, of a secure college for Hyde Bank Wood is not quite the same thing as would apply in the two adult male prisons. But there is no doubt that there is a lot of good work being done around rehabilitation um, in that context. Um, when I last visited McGilligan in the summertime, uh, over half of the prisoners in Foilview, the open aspect of McGilligan Prison, have been out the day before engaged in constructive and positive work for local churches, charities and community groups. So that was a sign of the kind of positive engagement around rehabilitation which happens there. With the, the recent opening of Barn House on the Crumlin Road, um, as the former working out unit 
for McGabry. It's also giving more prisoners the opportunity in their latter time in custody to go out and engage constructively and positively with the community. There are, of course, um, educational opportunities within both McGilligan and McGabry, but they're at a slightly different level than those which are aimed specifically at the younger offenders within High Bank Wood. But all of it is part of a joined up approach in trying to ensure as far as possible that when people leave prison, they have some sort of family support, they have some worthwhile activity, whether it's employment or education or further training, and that they have suitable accommodation to live in, because that's what makes society safer. Thank you, and that ends the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Trevor Lunn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, now that we have a new round of talks underway, would you, would you agree with me that the further dreadful revelations that have emerged in recent days, some of which have been referred to today, about the past make the case even more forcibly for a new effective means for dealing with the past? Well, certainly, Principal Deputy Speaker, I've said before now, and I fear I may be repeating, that the budget of the Department of Justice is a budget for dealing with the present and not the past. And there are many issues of the past which seem to me to be only being dealt with by the Department of Justice, with the current exception of the Historical and Institutional Abuse Inquiry. It is absolutely clear that we need agreement on appropriate structures to meet the needs of the past. And certainly the revelations which came through last week from Maria Cahill just a reminder that there were a variety of different issues which need to be addressed in the past and which will require a joined up approach by uh, parties working together, the executive working together, and hopefully the two governments working in conjunction with us. And I call Mr. Lund for a supplementary. Yes, thank you, Mr. Principal, that speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, whatever is agreed and promised to victims, it has to be deliverable. So, Will the Justice Department have a role to play in providing advice to the process to ensure that any new process is effective, efficient and Article 2 compliant? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I suppose one of the difficulties which we saw during the, uh, the talks which were led by Dr Richard Haas in the autumn of last year was that there was not the sort of um, information which has just been highlighted, information whether it comes from the Department of Justice or other government departments about how things work within Northern Ireland. During the course of the subsequent party leaders' talks in the early part of this year, my department did supply a couple of papers to the party leaders' meeting looking at issues relating to the past, how matters are currently being handled, how they might be better handled. And if such uh, papers are requested as we go through the detail of the current round of talks, then my department will certainly provide them because we currently bear the brunt of much of the difficulty of the past. I'm keen to ensure that we play our part in resolving the past. Again, I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Um, could I ask the Minister if he is aware that today is the seventh anniversary of the dreadful murder of Paul Quinn, uh, who, in the words of the International Monitoring Commission, uh, was murdered by current and former members of the IRA. And can I ask him what message he has for those in South Armagh who have information about this terrible crime and those who attempted to criminalise Paul Quinn? Well, Mr. Bradley raises a very serious point, Principal Deputy Speaker. I confess that although I saw some publicity last week in the middle of everything else I was doing today, I had forgotten that this was the seventh anniversary. But I did have some meetings around that time, and I'm well aware of the tragedy that was for the Quinn family and for others. I think what the message that I have is a message which I've just put out in other respects. Anybody who has any information about any criminal activity has a duty to report it to the PSNI so the PSNI can investigate properly and can pass a file to the Public Prosecution Service if there appears to be enough evidence for the, for the police to do so, so the PPS can determine whether a prosecution should take place. That is the responsibility of each and every one of us as citizens. It is also the responsibility of political leaders to put that point to the community and to encourage those who have information to report crime. Commissioner Bradley for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. 
and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, could I ask the Minister, uh, in light of what he has said, would he join with me in meeting uh, Stephen and Breach Quinn, Paul Quinn's parents, and uh, also in respect of re recent developments in the case, would he meet with his counterpart uh, in the South in order to uh, bring himself up to date with those latest developments? Well, I thank Mr Bradley for those points. On his latter point, uh, as members know, I meet fairly regularly and frequently uh, with my colleague, the Minister of Justice and Equality, and I'm certainly very happy uh, when I next meet Frances Fitzgerald to raise that particular issue with her. Um, on the specific issue of meeting Mr and Mrs Quinn, uh, I frequently meet people who feel they've been let down by the justice system at different occasions in the past. I tend not to flag them up in the media. I tend to believe that things are better done uh, with a certain degree of discretion in those circumstances. There is frequently very little the minister can do. But if the minister listening provides some measure of comfort to bereaved families, then I'm happy to use my time to provide that measure of comfort and assistance. And if Mr Bradley wishes to, to talk about that privately with me later, I'll happily discuss it with him. Thank you. And I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Laura Maggart, please ask can call you. And can I thank the Minister so far? But uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, are you satisfied the courts are doing enough in sentencing those inv involved in major organised crime in the Larn area? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I really do need to be ever so slightly careful. Um, I mean, there were a number of threads within that question. Uh, I need to be extraordinarily careful as Minister that I don't appear to be second-guessing the work of judges. I may talk about issues in general. We may talk in here about sentencing policy in general, as indeed we were doing earlier about the human trafficking issue. But we need to be very careful, uh, all of us, that we don't stray beyond our specific role, and particularly as Minister that I don't stray beyond my specific role into issues of individual sentencing in individual cases. He also raises the issue where he highlights the Larn area. Um, frankly, um, my concerns are to ensure that I provide the appropriate support to all the justice agencies in dealing with serious and organized crime in every part of Northern Ireland, uh, using the resources we have available, working in cooperation with our colleagues in Angarda Shikona and in England, Wales and Scotland. Um, hopefully, at some point in the near future, including bringing in the services of the National Crime Agency to deal with the serious crime that they can fight, and that is an issue which applies in every part of Northern Ireland. So whilst he may wish to highlight Larne in particular, I as Minister will put my concerns about the whole of Northern Ireland uh, to the forefront in ensuring that the justice agencies are assisted as best they can on my part in dealing with those issues. I call Mr McMullen for a supplementary. Can I, can I thank the Minister for that intriguing answer? But, but will the Minister, will the minister uh, agree with me that uh, the, uh, the publicity that Lauren has had recently and in, in, in the past, it, it is in the grips of paramilitaries, loyalist paramilitaries, and that is still going on today. And the events earlier in this year where 200 took over the town and caused mayhem in one night and still were waiting for to see any of them brought before the courts that is, that, that is a responsibility for me when I am asked by the community. And can I ask you, Minister, will you uh, ensure that those people who have been arrested and charged will be brought before the court soon? Principal Deputy Speaker, I would wish to see people who are guilty of crimes arrested and brought before the courts soon. But I have no responsibility whatsoever for ensuring that that happens. Thank you. And I will not be calling the member listed at number four. I call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Um, and I wonder, uh, uh, the question I'd like to ask the Minister is, following the find of uh, an illegal abattoir in County Monaghan at the weekend, can I ask the Minister, has he had any co uh, contact with his counterpart in the south of Ireland regarding this serious matter? <coughs> Principal Deputy Speaker, I have not had any specific contact with my colleague on the issue of the Ill illegal abattoir in County Monaghan. Um, if there are specific issues which Ms. Ra Ms. Ran thinks that I should be raising with Francis Fitzgerald, I have no doubt she will now take the opportunity to do so. 
Well, um, I would strongly urge the Minister to engage with all relevant departments, north and south, um, because this is a very serious matter. Um, and I trust that the Minister sees how serious it is and also uh, the importance of contacting health because of traceability and uh, potential health concerns. Well, yes, I certainly appreciate the serious points that were made. I'm not sure if Ms. Ram was in the House when I answered the earlier question um, from her colleague, Ms. McGahan, which was looking at the issue of uh, potential uh, livestock thefts and cross-border movements, which was highlighted from the South Tyrone side rather than the Monaghan side. So I am well aware of those difficulties. It is an issue in which there has been engagement between my department and DART, and I have no doubt there will continue to be. It is also clearly an issue uh, in terms of potential concerns about illegal abattoirs and the health standards which are operating there, uh, which becomes an issue which involves principally DART and DHSSPS on our side, and clearly their southern uh, departmental equivalents may also be involved as well. There are real issues here which tie into wider matters that we've talked about in terms of organised crime, um, the, you know, what we've termed the Changing the Mindset project that the PSNI has been leading uh, with regard to counterfeit goods and dubious services within Northern Ireland. We need to let people know that if they're buying something and it seems too good a bargain to be true, it almost certainly is. Whether it be a dodgy DVD, whether it be uh, perfumes which are inappropriate, whether it be batteries, or whether it now be meat as well. And in particular, in the case um, of anything to do with foodstuffs, there are significant health issues potentially there. The, you know, the issue has to be that those involved in any part of the food supply chain need to carry out their duties properly to ensure that matters are dealt with in a way which ensures full safety and full security of the food chain throughout, and ensure that uh, those who are customers ensure they're careful where they buy their produce from and don't get taken in by those with the back street or back of a car boot deals which are literally too good to be true. Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, could he provide the House with an update on the cross-departmental work that has taken place in respect of early intervention? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, there have been a number of issues relating to early interventions uh, over the last couple of years. My department tends to be something of a minor partner in that. There is no doubt that if we are looking at good preventive work with the families of young children to ensure uh, that those children do not get into a variety of difficulties in the future, uh, that health and education have a larger role than justice does, and indeed we will also see the returns quicker than justice would. Nonetheless, in some projects, we are partners because I believe the justice system has a role to play and the justice system also potentially has future benefit from such interventions. Thank you for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the information. Um, could he outline what he believes the benefits of cross-departmental work are in, in relation to early intervention work? I actually think you could say, in a general sense, Principal Deputy Speaker, that there are significant in benefits from cross-departmental working, uh, which we sometimes don't see, given the way our departments are set up in silos. But Mr. Agnew has highlighted the fact that we do need to see departments working better together. That applies across a variety of different areas, and there's no doubt, as we look at the resource problems we currently face, and a variety of difficulties there, that we need to ensure that we get joined up working in as many different places as possible. In terms of that early intervention cross-departmental working, there is no doubt from research both here and in other parts of these islands that in many cases a small number of families in any one particular neighbourhood may well make significant demands on education, on health, on social services, on justice, on housing, on employment. And there is no doubt in my mind that intensive intervention to support those families will give them significant benefits uh, particularly for the children in those families, to ensure that they get better opportunities as, as they grow up, their health is better, they take their educational opportunities, and that uh, in an ideal world they do not come into contact with the justice system in an unfortunate way in their teenage years. So all of those are, I think, the benefits of the kind of work which we've been seeking to pioneer over the last year or so. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Pat Sheehan. I've got a free last concorda. I wonder could the, uh, the minister provide us with an update on his department's continuing efforts to reduce car crime and uh, so-called joyriding? 
Well, again, Principal Deputy Speaker, it's not so much my department's efforts around car crime as the justice system as a whole. I mean, we, we see, obviously, at the first level, uh, the work of the PSNI in dealing with car crime. Um, they clearly have to decide in terms of their current uh, list of issues to deal with, how they prioritise particular areas of crime and what, what resources they could put into that. There's also work being done around the preventive area, for example, by Youth Justice Agency, because there are issues which are more than just dealing with crime when it happens, but about dealing with the preventive work. Almost the same kind of thing as I've just been highlighting to Mr. Agnew about early interventions, because there is early intervention work to be done, not just amongst the families of very young children, but amongst younger teenagers to prevent them getting into crime and to stop them when they are in danger of getting into crime and antisocial behaviour. And order uh, time is up, and that concludes question time. Thank you, Minister.